Hi, this is Peter Brusso for the Luxury Travel Podcast, and we have our host, I'm the co-host, we have our host, Charles Greenberg. How are you doing today, Charlie? Great, Peter. Nice to be with you today. Thanks very much. You know, I've been wanting to do this kind of thing for some time, and um, we're actually getting a chance to talk a little bit about podcasting and luxury travel. So what's today's topic today? We're going to talk about uh, cruising today. Uh, cruises are my absolute favorite way to travel for a whole bunch of reasons, and I can expand on that uh, if you'd like. But today we're going to talk about cruising. Okay, great. Why don't you give us an intro about cruising, and I think I have some questions from people, I'm sure, that have uh, questions about cruising, like seasickness, and how do I find my cabin, and you may go through all of those things, so I'll, I'll shut up, but tell us a bit about cruising, and I'd like a Q&A afterwards. Thank you. First of all, cruising is my favorite kind of vacation for a few different reasons. I, I love the idea of, first of all, that you pay once, and for the most part, the rest of the trip is all-inclusive. And I said for the most part because there are, there are exceptions. But that means that you, of course, have your lodging. You have your cabin on the ship. All meals are included, and cruises are famous for feeding you very well. Uh, and entertainment on the ship is all included. Uh, things that cost a bit extra are... Uh, if you go to the spa, if you buy something in the store, on most ships, alcoholic beverages are extra. Uh, some ships, they are not. Uh, gratuities are extra, again, on some ships, but not on all. So on the luxury cruise lines, where you pay more to get on the ship, there are many things, many additional things that are in, included in that. So for those reasons, that's why cruising is my favorite way to vacation. And, of course, the granddaddy of them at all, of all, uh, you go to sleep at night, you come back from an evening of entertainment, there's a program waiting for you on your bed, your room's been freshly remade for the evening, and there's a program waiting for you with all the activities on the ship for the next day and some information. You go to sleep, and while you're sleeping, your hotel magically moves, and you wake up with, in a new city to explore. So that's one, those are the key reasons why I enjoy cruising. Uh, you mentioned something a second ago about uh, seasickness. I've heard all the excuses why people don't want to cruise or they or those who haven't been on a cruise. I think something like 80% of the country's population have not taken a cruise. Uh, and there are things like, I'm going to get seasick. I'm going to be bored. I'll feel trapped. There'll be nothing to do. It's only for old people. It's only for newlyweds. They're going to stuff me with food. I don't like shuffleboard. You know, all, all the questions like that. Um, and you're not going to be bored. The likelihood of getting seasick is very remote. The ships uh, all have, the modern ships all have stabilizers. If that were a real issue, I would encourage somebody to take a river cruise. Uh, which is right now one of the hottest segments in cruise travel right now, both in Europe and in North America as well. Um, so those are just uh, some, of, some of the negatives that I can easily dispel. You're going to have a smooth ride. You're probably not going to get seasick. There are more things for you to do on board the ship than you would have time to do, to do them. Uh, some of the newer larger ships are just like a floating resort. Uh, the things you would expect at a luxury resort property, you'll find on board the ship as well. Um, well I, don't think, I don't think a lot of us know what to expect uh, on board a ship. Why don't you tell us what a luxury ship should contain? I mean, I've never been on one, so... Okay, sure. Well, I think um, one of the reasons that people may not have gone on a cruise is because there's a little bit of a fear of the unknown gee, I'm going to get to this ship, and where do I go? What do I do? How do I find my room? Uh, where do we eat? Uh, who do we have to tip? Um, uh, can I, if I go to the buffet, can I take anything that I want? Uh, when I go into the nightclub for entertainment, do I have to pay? Am I obligated to buy drinks? So these, these are things, so rather than deal with these unknowns, 
I think I'll just go back to the usual beach hotel that I've gone to before and they're really missing a wonderful life experience to, to take a cruise. Um, I should mention while we're talking about this that cruises really go all, all over the world. Before 9-11 uh, most cruises were limited to either the Caribbean or uh, from Miami or Alaska from Vancouver or Seattle. Uh, since then, the cruise lines have opened up numerous ports up and down the east coast and the west coast. So here on the west coast where I live, uh, you can sail from San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Seattle, and Vancouver and a couple of smaller ports as well as that. Uh, wow. On the East Coast there are even more. Uh, you know, on the Gulf Coast, uh, Galveston has become a major port. Mobile, Alabama has become a wow. major port. So uh, there's a huge percentage of the American population that's within close driving distance to a ship. And any time, I'll speak for myself personally, any time I don't have to get on an airplane, or any time I don't have to worry about which bag I can put the liquids in so they'll get through security, that's a good day. So if I yeah, can oh, yeah. on vacation, I, I like that. Yeah. Um, so why don't we talk about um, what happens when you when you get on the on the ship? You show you show up at the pier and then what? What what can I expect to happen? Okay. So uh, when you receive your boarding documents from the cruise line or from your travel agent. It'll say embarkation, boarding the ship, will be from 1 to 5 or 2 to 4 p.m. And those are the optimal times for you to show up to get on the ship. So almost like an airport, there's a check-in counter in the ship's ter in the cruise line's terminal. You'll get on the, uh, on the line. They'll check your credentials. Uh, the ship runs as a pretty much cashless society. So if you do want to spend some money on some of those extras that I mentioned before, like the spa or alcoholic beverages, or you buy something in the shop, uh, you just present your room key card with a magnetic stripe. The, the um, person you're buying the service from will take that card and swipe it, and that'll go on the ship's folio. So when you check in on the pier, you'll give them the credit card that you want to use against your onboard charging card. And they'll record that, and they'll give you the, that key to your room, and you're off to the races. You go. To me, one of the most exciting moments is walking up uh, the gangway and leaving land and, and getting on board the ship. Uh, since most cruise lines board you midday, uh, they, they turn the ship around the same day it comes in. So passengers on the previous cruise will disembark, Mm -hmm. around 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning. While that's happening, the ship is being restocked with provisions, and at about 12, 1 or 2, a new group of passengers will board. And on this day, for most ships, instead of having a combination of dining room, sit-down service, and the buffet, on this day, only because it's the first day, it's usually a buffet. So most passengers will go up to the buffet area on the ship. Lots of ships call it the Lido deck. And you'll have lunch, and that'll be your first meal on board the ship. What I do usually after that is um, I explore for a few minutes. I'd like to see where the swimming pools are, if it's an indoor pool or not. want to see where the uh, gym is, take a look at the nightclub. Might want to see if there's more than one dining room, which dining room I'll be in. Uh, at times, I've even been known to look at my table to make sure I have a nice table in the dining room. Uh, and then, by then, your room is all made up and ready, and you can go back to your room. Uh, bags, uh, when you get to the pier, your luggage is dropped with a porter or a stevedore, and that gets delivered directly to your room, right outside the door of your room. Wow. So by the time you get to your room, your bags are probably waiting for you. If they're not there yet, they'll be there soon, and you start unpacking. Uh, you can explore a little bit more. There's a program of that day's activities. There's often a sail away program. You can go up on deck near the poolside. Uh, and if it's a Caribbean cruise, they'll have a Calypso band or something like that. Uh, and you get acclimated. You get settled. Uh, and then late afternoon, there's a mandatory uh, safety at sea drill. 
that everybody has to attend. That's become critically uh, being taken very seriously since uh, a couple of tragic accidents that uh, cost a ship uh, that had the accident off the coast of Italy uh, a few years ago. So those are taken very seriously. Mandatory attendance, no exception, and everybody goes to the safety at sea lifeboat drill. Uh, after that, there will be some other safety drills during the course of the week, but those are for the crew. You're at that point done with the safety drills. Okay, and uh, I would gather that you're not going to have any kind of experience like the Titanic where there's not enough lifeboats for everybody? <laughs> I'll, I'll share a funny story. Um, I did a transat transatlantic crossing on the QM2, the Queen Mary 2, a few years ago, and we really did have rough weather. The North Atlantic is known to be stormy, and we were, we were moving around a little bit, which doesn't bother me at all. And uh, like the third day of the cruise, the captain made his midday announcement. And he said, uh, many of our guests are asking me when we'd be passing near the site of the Titanic. And uh, he said, it was actually the day of the storm, but I decided not to tell you that. Oh, <laughs> gosh. <laughs> he was being very kind to us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I would think so. Captain, but it, captains I can think be very kind. I think one of the things that they learned from all of that is that they certainly have really uh, stepped up their game on safety. I mean, uh, enough lifeboats for everybody. Um, everybody's trained. They know what they're doing. You know, the uh, the the whole fiasco with the Italian ship there isn't going to happen again. I don't think. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, never say never, but that is not likely to happen again. There was a case of a couple that uh, every uh, cruise line has an alumni association. So uh, in the sense that once you've been on the cruise line, you'll get uh, points towards a future cruise. You'll get mailings with discount coupons to try to encourage you to come back, which is just good marketing. Uh, and there was a couple on a ship. I won't say which cruise line it was. And uh, these people had been on many cruises before. They were very good customers. And uh, they were tired. And they decided... We don't want to go to the safety drill. We're going to stay in our cabin. They won't find us. They did find them, and they, mm. threw, them, they threw them off the ship. They oh, you're kidding. Them. Yeah, you're gone. You're gone. That's how seriously they take it. And, um, I mean, they, obviously, very good customers who always had good things to say about this cruise line, very upscale cruise line, too. And that's how seriously they, they take uh, safety of life at sea. Now, uh, have you taken any of the river cruises yet? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I have. Uh, they're incredibly popular right now. Um, the uh, one that I was on most recently was on the Danube. Uh, we uh, spent uh, three nights in Prague in the Czech Republic uh, on our own, uh, although you could do it through the cruise line if you want to. We were on our own, and then uh, we uh, had the cruise line had a bus that took us from Prague to Nuremberg, uh, and we got on the ship in Nuremberg and stayed docked for that night in Nuremberg. The next day, we took tours in Nuremberg, sailed from all the way uh, up the Danube to um, Budapest. Went through. We spent a couple of nights in Vienna on the way, then Budapest, overnight in Budapest, and then we got off the ship and spent a few nights in Budapest at a hotel. River cruising ha has a lot to offer. Um, it's in some ways it's similar to ocean cruising other ways it's the same uh, you're on a ship you're in the cabin uh, most most river cruises are much more all-inclusive where wine and beer and soft drinks are included uh, bottles of water like this one are replenished in your cabin every day you don't have to pay extra for them because you're sailing on uh, a river rather than the ocean you tend to dock right in the center of town so on some ocean cruises you'll have a bit of a ride to get from the dock to the inner city uh, in these small towns even Budapest and uh, Nuremberg you're docking right in the center of town you can get off the ship um, the, cru the river cruises tend to be quite smooth you're not going to have a, a bumpy ride at all because you're in an inland waterway Sure. Uh, 
everything, all the meals, of course, are included in alcohol, as I said. The cruise line we were on had bicycles and helmets. So if you wanted to drive around, ride around town on your bike like a local, you were free to do that. You could ride along the canal, along the river, uh, the pathway along the river, right parallel to the ship after it starts moving and pick it up in the next village that you're going to visit. It was a great experience. River cruises, by, the, by definition, have to be low. They tend to be no more than three decks, maybe four maximum, because they have to sail under some of these ancient old bridges in uh, European waterways. Uh, they can't be very wide. They, they have to be narrow for the same reason to get under the bridges. So they're really easy to uh, maneuver th about. The largest cruise ship in the world has a capacity of 5,400 passengers. Huge. That's crazy. Average river cruise, maybe the largest river cruise, maybe 120 or 130 passengers. Oh, well, so it's quite intimate. Yeah, yeah. You, you get to know your fellow passengers' names. The crew gets to know your name within a couple of days. Uh, it's the kind of thing where, uh, Peter, if you like iced coffee with your lunch, when you would come down for lunch the second day, there'd be an iced coffee at your place because the waiter knows you. That's it. Now, a, a this is... This is a geeky question. Uh, what's the difference in the in the safety briefings and stuff you got to go through uh, with a river cruise versus a, a ocean cruise? They're pretty much the same. They're pretty much the same. The the river cruise is much more manageable. Everybody gets into one room. On an ocean cruise, there are different muster stations all around the ship, and you take your life jacket from your cabin, you put it on. And as you're going to the muster station, there's a number on the life jacket that identifies which muster station you're supposed to be at. So the crew that's working the safety drill will point you number five to the left, number six to the right, and like that. Interesting. Uh, in the, on the river cruise, everybody goes into the lounge. You're sitting in comfortable seats, and the staff on the ship will direct you in the unlikely event of an emergency. Right, right. That's that's pretty cool. Um, you just reminded me of, of another funny captain story that, that I thought of. We, we've we taken a bunch of short cruises from Los Angeles that go down to Ensenada. Usually it'll stop in Ensenada or Catalina or San Diego. And the very first one that I was on many years ago, the captain said, uh, at, during the lifeboat drill, let the uh, safety at life, safety of life at sea drill. He said, um, you really don't have to worry on this ship because we're never more than 15 minutes away from McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Yeah, that may be true, but getting there might be a little uh, a little difficult, you know? No, we don't want it to go there. Really. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to do that. No, okay, so so that sounds good. And, and who, is there a, a different type of people that would take, or if you, well, let me back up. If you have never taken a cruise, um, is there any profile that would suggest you would steer them towards a river cruise versus a ocean cruise? Well, that, that, that's a, a bigger question than well, the one you asked. Uh, a great question, actually. Uh, that's one of the values of working with a travel agent uh, because cruise lines do have, cruise lines and river cruises, do have their own personality. So if you're a very sophisticated person who enjoys chamber music and poetry readings and fine literature, you don't want to get on certain ships where the atmosphere is rowdy, something like that. Uh, and conversely, if you're looking for a really loud time and you enjoy rock and roll, you don't want to get on a ship where the main activity is, is going to be chamber music. Right. And travel agent will make sure that the um, experience fits your needs. Uh, that what your what your expectations are are met. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a big believer in finding a travel agent that you really like to handle your travel for you. If there's any problem, you know, Expedia, the, some of the other ones, not not to dice this them at all, but you know, they're just not programmed for 
close quarter support uh, mm-hmm. of a client in at least in my experience that is sure. so, and I always like to be able to to talk to a travel agent I, I always have travel agents book my stuff yeah thanks for saying that I, I appreciate that cruise lines uh, are in the business of selling their own cruises and the large internet travel agencies are very impersonal and won't take the time to say Peter what kind of a trip do you like uh, comparing that to a, a personal agent who will care for you and make sure that you have a good experience. There's nobody else who will look at the cabin that they're about to assign to you and say, check it and make sure that it's not underneath the dance floor or underneath the kitchen or it's not beneath the promenade where people are are doing their morning exercise while you're trying to sleep. Uh, That's the value of a good travel agent. Another, Another key point, if I can toot my horn for a second is that the prices that a travel agent charges are at the very worst the same as what the cruise line charges or the internet companies charge. I won't get into the reasons for that but everybody is on a level playing field and sells the cruise for the same price. Uh, There are times there are some specials available to personal agents like me that even beat the prices that the cruise lines themselves charge. So there's every reason to book through an agent um, again to get that personal experience and get all the service that an agent can provide. Yeah, I think that the it makes a lot more sense to go through an agent to tell them what you, you know, get to know them a little bit. They get to know you, and they're able then to um, make sure your cruising experience is a positive one, versus getting stuck. Uh, I I have my own cruise story. I've only been on one, and it was. Uh, tell me. Uh, it, well, it was one of the Ensenada cruises out of L.A. to Ensenada and back. And uh, our, our cabin uh, had uh, um, a beam going right down the middle of it and two twin beds, actually two single beds on either side of that. And it was our wedding. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, oh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, so you learn. I don't think a travel agent would have let that happen. Yeah, I don't think I think a travel agent would pick that up. You don't want to be on your honeymoon cruise with an upper and a lower buck. Does not compute. Yeah, well, you you make do with what you got, mind you. But uh, on the flip side, that's not the experience you really wanted to have. Yeah, you know, one of the things I ask people when uh, we're talk we start talking about cruising, I'll say, tell me about some of the hotels that you've enjoyed staying at. Now, for some people. You know, a Holiday Inn, a Holiday Inn Express is a good trip for them. That's great. For somebody else who has fond experiences for the Four Seasons or St. Regis or the Ritz-Carlton, well, that also tells me about the kind of experience they want. And then I can uh, adjust the product that will be offered to them uh, based upon where what they're used to, the comfort comforts that they're used to. Um, a big part of it, of course, is the itinerary. What part of the world do you want to see? You want to travel to Europe? You want to see Alaska while it's still there, while it still exists? Um, that's a little joke about the icebergs, uh, about the glaciers, I mean. Um, but there, there are, there's really no part of the world that is not covered with uh, cruises, including the Holy Land. So well, just, you- it's interesting to note too. I think there's a lot of millennials uh, that have never cruised, and they're going to want to cruise. And millennials are really a different creature than than us baby boomer types. And a travel a- agent that's pretty switched on, like with social media, like yourself, uh, you're starting to understand the millennials a little bit better. That they need to be socially connected. They they like that. They they like climbing walls. They like things that are action-packed and fast and and whatnot. Like you talked, it's not chamber music, and it's certainly, you know, maybe not internet. Let's talk internet. I, I do. They have any internet contact out there? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, historically, it's been slow through a satellite, but there's a new company that's providing the service for a number of ships where it's fast, high-speed internet. It. Oh. it so it, it used to be a little bit frustrating. You'd be sitting at the computer, and it would load, and it would load, it would continue to load, uh, and you could bring a sandwich and a change of underwear while you were waiting for, for it to load. I, 
I have that have just recently gotten rid of my slow uh, speed internet out here, as you well know, and sure. I could read War and Peace just trying to get my email. Sure. You know, so I, I don't want that as an experience on the sea either. I mean, for all the technology you would think is around you, you ought to be able to hook to the internet and share your videos and pictures with your friends. You know, yeah. that's much. It's much better than it was, and it's continuing to get better. The technology uh, is catching up there. Right, and I think the millennials would really uh, like that kind of thing, I yeah. think. Anyway, my daughter got married, uh, one of my twins, and uh, she took a cruise out of Florida into the Bahamas. I haven't heard anything about it, but they seem to have a great, wonderful oh, time. Cool. They did, they did uh, some scuba diving uh, with um, actually a shallow water rig uh, on, and I mean, they experienced a lot of stuff, I think, yeah. uh, and, and they had a great time, and, and they're millennials, you know. And so, um, you know, we'll have to have them on the show. Earlier on, um, I, I was mentioning people having the wrong expectations about their vision of going on a cruise is sitting on a chaise lounge under a blanket sipping bouillon. Uh, and that, you know, maybe in the era of the Titanic, that's what you did. <laughs> but the new one, <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, um, the new <laughs> modern ships have uh, great, great programs for young people. Uh, the, you know, they almost not all, but many of them have um, water uh, coasters. What do you call the water coaster? Why am I blanking out on that? The water, water slides. Water slides. Yeah. Yeah. On board, uh, one of the Disney ships has one that's clear, and the slide goes out over off the side of the ship, so you're actually over the ocean, and then it it comes back. Um, uh, onto the ship, of course. Uh, one of the new ships has bumper cars. There's a room with bumper cars, little bumper cars. Uh, there have been bowling alleys on ships, a uh, couple of ships for a while. Uh, all kinds of uh, active, there's a skydiving simulator on, on a new ship. There, there, rock climbing has been around for a while. So there, there are lots of things, and this is just on the ship itself. When I say more things to do than you could possibly imagine. It would be really interesting to have a show based around the unusual aspects or things that are on some of these cruises. That would be interesting. Sure, sure. Well, I don't know. I don't know if there's enough to make a whole show, but I can imagine that there's a lot of different stuff uh, on cruises that you wouldn't really even expect. You know, like. You talked earlier about uh, cruises that are specializing more for autistic kids and 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 the blind and uh, you know there's just a plethora it seems like of of opening of different cruise what do I want to say genres I guess for lack of a better word sure sure um, Disney uh, does a a really good job they in terms of their youth counselors have all been certified in dealing with children with special needs. And they, they have a credo of no child gets left behind. And there's something for everybody on a cruise. If a, uh, an autistic child uh, is startled by loud noises or bright lights, uh, they, they have uh, ways of avoiding that and they have uh, preparation so the young person is aware of what's going to happen and not be surprised and not be frightened. And so they can have that same enjoyable experience. Yeah, and for people like ourselves, there's no DUIs, I don't think, uh, uh, citations given on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right. Well, that, okay. So this has been a good good little travel podcast, and uh, we tend to have more of these in the future. Uh, what kinds of shows are we looking at doing? Well, I'd like, I'd like to expand a little bit on... Uh, what happens when you get on the ship? We talked about it for that first afternoon uh, when, until you get your luggage. But how about on a future show we talk about when you go to the dining room? How do you, how do you get settled? Uh, do I eat alone? Do I eat with different people every day? Um, and then when I go to the shows, what, what's typical life like from day to day? So we could do that. Uh, it might be fun also to talk about some of the destinations, some of my favorite cruises, uh, where people like to go, they basically come in two different flavors. You can have fun in the sun, or you can do uh, historic, historic sites, things that... Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. 
Uh, so we, we can talk about that. We can talk about some of the new features on the new ships, the latest ships that are, are oh, that'll be interesting. under construction uh, that are coming out now, the leaders of the cruise industry. No shortage of, of things to talk about. Talk about the best quality food on board, the best children's programs, cruises. Uh, a, a real annoying feature for some people is that cruises charge a per person rate based on double occupancy. So if there's a single person who wants to take a cruise, they actually are paying for the empty bed. They're paying a, a significant amount for that empty bed in the room. Some cruise lines are getting away from that and they have room, single rooms for one person. And oh, that's, that's really good. That's a real boon. We can talk about that. Yeah. Uh, there are cruises. There, most cruises now have, uh, in the daily activities, there are um, programs for single people to meet and other special interest groups to meet. So there, are, uh, there's a lots of great things we can talk about in the future. Okay, great, great, great. Well, all right. Thanks for hosting the show, and we'll make sure everybody knows when we're on next time. You're great, Peter. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Thank Charlie. Bye. Bye.